Uh, like Dave said, you can turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 11. We're going to look at verses 28 through 30 tonight of Matthew chapter 11. And while y'all are flipping there, I want to throw a question at you. Are you at rest in Christ? Are you at rest in Christ? I think a lot of you probably know this, but uh, Lauren and I dated uh, long distance for the entirety of our dating relationship. And so what this meant for me is that if I wanted to see her on a regular basis, I had to spend all of my money on flights and rental cars. I can't tell you how many cars I rented during the time of us dating, but it, I rented a lot of cars. And initially, this would actually make me kind of uncomfortable. You know, you get into this vehicle, and, and I didn't want to be reckless and, and damage this expensive car that wasn't mine. But after the third or fourth time I had rented one, something changed, and I got real comfortable. See, I got so comfortable and so familiar with the people at Enterprise that I would go in and not just rent cars with confidence, but I would convince these people to give me a pickup truck even though I was only old enough to rent small sedans and crossovers. And if you were to see me at one of these red lights, man, like you wouldn't catch me driving these big pickup trucks with, with two hands. Like I'd get in a truck and I'd just kind of make myself at home and, and, and I'd make sure the radio was, was set to all of my favorite stations. I'd hook my phone up to Bluetooth. I'd get in the truck and just kind of really be at home. And if you saw me at the red light, there weren't two hands, but there was one wrist, not even, not even a single hand, but one wrist resting on the steering wheel. Like, you saw me in this truck, and you were going to know, however long I was renting it, like, oh, that's, that's Trail's truck. Like, he owns that thing. Like, he is at home. He is rested in that truck. Now, this was completely different than the first few times I rented. See, the first few times, I was overly cautious. I didn't want anything bad to happen. But once I got comfortable... I could rest. I could rest as I rented the truck. And the reason I tell you all about that is because I think some of us struggle to rest in our relationships with Christ. See, we treat our relationship with God as if we're first-time renters instead of experienced renters who have a sense of security about ourselves. We rejoice in the work that our faith calls us to, but we don't rejoice in the rest that Christ offers us with our faith. And in tonight's passage, we're going to see that Christ tells us to both rest in him and he tells us to work for him. And he tells us why we can be secure when we do both of these things. Uh, so two simple points that I want us to unpack. The first one, as Christians, we should go to Christ to find our rest. And then the second one, as Christians, we should go to Christ to find our work. We should go to Christ to find our rest. and We should also go to Christ to find our work. I'll read the, the verses for us now, then I want to ask for the Lord's help myself as we walk through the, the verses together. So Matthew chapter 11, starting at verse 28, it reads, Come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take up my yoke and learn from me, because I am lowly and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. This is the word of the Lord. Join me for one more moment of prayer. Father, we thank you so much that you are a God who offers us rest. Father, we thank you that in our relationships with you, we can be secure because of what you've accomplished in Christ. We thank you that in our shortcomings in our fallen nature, Christ comes to us being gentle and lowly in heart. God, I pray and ask that we rejoice in this and rejoicing knowing that we have a Savior who doesn't call us to a life of toil and labor apart from him, but he calls us to a life of restful work in which he joins us and labors on our behalf. I pray and ask that you make that clear through your word tonight. And I pray and ask that as I seek to, to proclaim your word to your people, that you'd use me. I pray and ask that they'd hear from your word and not hear my words, God. Would you step in and make up for any inadequacies that I have so that your people might be built up, so that your church might be edified, 
so that your kingdom will be advanced through our growing in Christ likeness. And so that we would all walk away resting in you and joyfully working for you. It's in the name of your son we pray. Amen. Now, if you're prone towards legalism like I am, this first point that Jesus makes will probably leave you a little uncomfortable. But one thing about Jesus is that he often said things with the intent to make people uncomfortable. And I think we see some of that here in our passage. See, right before this passage, in the earlier parts of chapter 11, Jesus ridiculed the generation of people that he was talking to because they seemed discontent with whatever a prophet was to do when they came and prophesied. They didn't like John the Baptist because he fasted as he prophesied about Jesus, and now they don't like Jesus because he comes and he's enjoying food and drink as he prophesies about himself. So Jesus ridicules them because they seem to have problems with prophets no matter what the prophets do. And then he ridicules specific towns because he had performed miracles among these towns, and he performed miracles so that the the people in these towns could see that he was the miraculous God in human flesh, but they didn't respond and repent like he commanded them to. They didn't repent because they were so busy trying to live and have others live by these crazy checklists that they formed as their own standards of righteousness. But in our passage, Jesus offers this invitation. It was an invitation to them, and now it's an invitation to us. He says, come to me, and I'll give you rest. Now, by implication, when Jesus gives his invitation and tells us to come to him, not only are we labeling him as our place of destination, but we're also labeling something else as our place of departure, right? Like in order to go or or to come somewhere, you got to leave where you're at to get there. And in this passage, I think Matthew wants us to see that Jesus invites the burden to leave the burdening legalistic culture that the Pharisees had kind of set up and, and developed around them. And I want us to notice that this is both a command and an invitation. And Jesus actually gives us insight into how powerful he is with who he addresses as he gives his invitation and command. He says, come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. He says, come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened, and I'll give you rest. So Jesus extends his invitation to whoever will come. Right before these verses, Matthew writes that Jesus praised God the Father, and he talked about how he revealed hidden things about himself specifically to those whom he desired to reveal them. It says he praised the Father for allowing some to know him. And then when we get to our verses, it seems that the some whom he gives this revelation to are those who are willing to acknowledge their weariness and their burdenness in order to come to him. But I love that Jesus says all. See, that's Jesus letting us know that he isn't limited in the rest he can offer. He's limited in the rest he'll give. But the condition isn't one on his part. The condition is that those who want his rest must be those who acknowledge they're weary and burdened without it. He says anybody who's willing to do that, anybody who's willing to do that and come to me can have my rest. And so if you're in a room and you're someone who doesn't have a relationship with Christ, if you've not trusted him as your Savior, surrendered to him as Lord, Consider this invitation in the passage. Consider this invitation an invitation to you for you to come to him and find this rest that he's talking about. See, when Jesus says rest, he's talking about a supernatural rest that correlates to a supernatural eternal salvation. So when you look around at the world and you see stuff stuff that's just not right, you see stuff that is clearly immoral and it makes you feel a sense of, of weariness and burden, what you're actually seeing is a world that is affected by sin and in need of rest or restoration from Christ. And when you look internally and you see this same thing, you know, man, I'm immoral. I can't seem to get it right. There's something off about me. What you sense here is the weariness and burden that comes with the realization that you yourself are also sinful and in need of restoration from Christ. But when Jesus says all, he means all. That means anybody, any and everybody who will come to him and trust the truth 
that he sacrificed his life on a cross and then resurrected from death to overcome that which wearies and burdens us. Anyone who does that can have the eternal rest and salvation that they need for their souls. Jesus himself, he gets more specific when he talks about this in verse 29. He says, if you come to me and take my yoke, not only will you find rest, but you will find rest for your souls. He's in the business of giving soul rest. The innermost, eternal part of our beings, the core of who we are as humans, that part of us that has been kind of thrown off by sin and now yearns to be recalibrated in righteousness before God the Father, he says, come to me, and that part of you can have rest. The part of us that yearns most deeply. Jesus wants to give us rest for our souls. Man, praise God that he's not only a God who offers rest, but he's a God who offers rest for our souls. And if you're a Christian in the room, here's the question I want to pitch to you. What is it that causes your soul to be weary and burdened? Remember, for this crowd that Jesus is talking to, it was the, the Pharisaic culture, right? It was the constant pressure to, to check all the religious boxes and, and make all the right sacrifices and do all the right things on the Sabbath. But what is it for us? And now it may feel like we're kind of working backwards when I ask this question. You know, we just talked about how those who are saved have, have souls that rest in Christ. But being that we're still people who are not yet fully redeemed, there are still sinful parts of us that have sinful tendencies to run to the things that make us weary and burdened. Sometimes we're burdened because of what society places on us, but other times we may be burdened because we get antsy and, and resting in, in, in Christ. That's not where we feel fulfilled anymore. See, those of us who are legalists like me, we don't like this idea of resting. We want to feel like we're doing something. We want to feel like we're contributing to our faith. And in a church like ours, where we have such a great culture of majoring on holiness, and we talk so much about like, all that we can do in order to demonstrate our faith, it can be really easy to forget that while all this doing is good and it brings glory to God, it isn't the doing on our part that allows us to be saved. It's the done on Christ's part that has allowed us to be saved. One of the greatest proofs of a Christian's faith is the Christian fruit that he or she bears. But another great proof of a Christian's faith is the soulful rest that the Christian enjoys. Are you resting in Christ, friends? We should rest in knowing that Christ has accomplished all that is needed every single thing that is needed for our renewed righteousness before the Father. And so when people look at our lives, let's let them see us toil for the sake of holiness. But let's make sure they know we're not toiling because we want to earn something. We're toiling because of what we've already been given. Some of us in the room are becoming parents for the first time. And we'll struggle to, and, and, and be tempted to, to, to lose our rest in Christ with this, right? Am I being a good enough parent? Others of us are engaged in, in potentially planning weddings, and, and, and we'll struggle with that. Am I honoring God in the way that I plan? Some of us are in the early parts of a career. Do I do enough so that my colleagues know that I'm a Christian? Some of us run companies. We, we, we homeschool children. You know, am I doing enough as I, as I manage my people, as I teach my kids? If we think about finances, you know, God says it's wise for me to save, but he also calls me to give. How do I do both of these things in tandem? We're all doing something, right? And the thing is, we've got to realize that in everything we do, society is going to want to give us specific advice about exactly how we're supposed to do it. And if we aren't careful, we'll end up wearing ourselves out trying to check every box, trying to meet every status quo, trying to consider every bit of advice, and trying to meet every societal standard. We'll wear ourselves out physically, mentally, and spiritually, because in striving after all these things, we'll end up relying upon ourselves and serving the idol of self-fulfillment or success instead of doing what Christ calls us to do in this passage. He calls us to come to him, to leave the world's burdens, and to rest and the salvation that he gives us. In Matthew 22, verse 37, 
Christ gives advice that can kind of serve as an umbrella to any other good advice that we'll ever get in life. He advises us to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, and mind, and to love our neighbors as ourselves. Jesus himself said it. If we take that advice seriously, then everything else, it'll most likely fall in line. And we'll know what it's like to be resting in Christ while at the same time working for his glory. And that brings us to our second point. Not only are Christians called to go to Christ in order to find our rest, but we should also go to Christ in order to find our work. Right after Jesus calls the burden to come to him and to find rest for their souls, he tells us in verse 29, take up his yoke and learn from him. Now this term yoke is one that it would have been easily understood in Jewish culture. A yoke was a tool that you'd place around uh, the neck of a mule and, or some other livestock, whatever you were doing in the fields when you wanted animals to go in and work and plow fields for you. And so in a somewhat contradictory fashion, Jesus offers rest, but then he offers this yoke, which is always associated with work. And now a few things we need to understand here. The first thing is that this isn't some bait and switch that Jesus pulls over our eyes. The concept of resting while working, it actually should be a concept that is contradictory in the way we think about it. Except when you're talking about resting in Christ. The reason this contradiction becomes cohesive in Christ is because when he saves us and gives our souls the rest we long for, we find great joy and discover our purpose in living to display this work that he's done in us. One of my go-to verses in Scripture, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, it says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. I see, the old has passed away, and the new has come. Now, the reason this verse says see is because uh, the new life that we have in Christ it should actually be evident to those who observe our lives. So if you're someone who overemphasizes the freedom you have in Christ, then there's a chance you might be neglecting the call for your faith to be visible. No scripture doesn't forbid the consumption of alcohol, but it does forbid us from overconsumption and drunkenness. I can't think of a verse that explicitly says we shouldn't curse but we shouldn't have mouths like sailors and we should be modest in the things that we say on social media. There should be a stark contrast between God's people and the rest of the world. Our faith does call us to work. Christ tells us to take his yoke. But the second thing to understand about this is that the work Christ calls us to is not a work that we have to do alone. If you look back at verse 29, we see that Christ says we should take up his yoke but also that we should learn from him because he is gentle and lowly. Now, this idea of learning from him is one that kind of ties into the idea uh, or, or the Jewish understanding of what a yoke was. Oftentimes when, when, when the Jewish people, and I think people even today that uh, live in third world countries and, and use mules for their labor, uh, when you train a young mule, you put that mule with an older mule that has already been broken and knows how to act with a yoke on its neck. And the thought behind this is that the older mule will use his experience and teach the younger mule what it's like to work smarter instead of harder. Uh, Lauren and I have a lot of nephews and nieces, and uh, we spend a lot of time around um, just other children that have been in, our, been in our lives at different times. And if this has taught me anything, it's taught me that uh, you don't have to be an adult to be sinful and stubborn. See, I've seen stubbornness of children most clearly with some of the simplest tasks. I can remember teaching a few kids how to put their shoes on and how to tie their shoes, and you think these kids would be appreciative. But instead, as soon as they get a little independence about themselves and they kind of start to, to grasp the concept of what they're supposed to be doing and how to do it themselves, they start rejecting your help. So what I do is I kind of sit back and I take their rejection. But if they rejected my help before they were ready to go and tie their shoes on their own, one or two things always happened. Either they never actually get their shoes on and they come crying to me with tears of frustration, or I watch them put their shoes on and then watch them walk off with shoes that were pointing in two different directions, and then they come back to me crying because their toes were hurting. <laughs> See, kids need to know that the best thing for them is to be patient and to learn 
from an older, wiser teacher. But I think Jesus shows us in this passage that this isn't only a lesson for kids to learn. Even us as Christians, the best thing for us is to wear the yoke that God calls us to, but with the help of our older, wiser teacher. Christ doesn't give us this yoke and leave us to carry it ourselves. He gives us this yoke, and then he offers to carry the yoke with us. And then Jesus also refers to the character of his heart. And he says he's gentle and lowly in heart. this, This is the only place in all of the Gospels where Jesus actually tells us what his heart is like. And he uses these two words, gentle and lowly. That's really good news for us. See, what Christ is helping us understand here is that he, if he is the older, wiser mule who bears the yoke with us, he's not an old, grouchy mule. He's gentle, understanding, acceptable, approachable. He's willing to tolerate some of our youthful ignorance. See, Jesus has patience and humility towards us that our minds will never comprehend, friends. Romans 5, 8 says that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He came to pull us out of the worst of worst situations. And then he offers to help us in the most worthy of worthy work. So the reason we can simultaneously rest and work in Christ is because we don't work out of our own strength. In verse 30, and I'm closing with this, he says that his yoke is easy and his burden is light. That's not Christ telling us that the Christian life will be absent of challenges. That's him telling us that the yoke that he puts on us, that that the Christian life has work and it has challenges, but the weight of that work, it fades as we gaze at who Christ is and ponder what he's done for us. So my final encouragement to us tonight, friends, gaze at the glory of Christ. Go to him and find your rest. Go to him and find your work, and rejoice in doing both. Father, I pray and ask that you'd help us to be faithful to you in that. Would you help us, God, to recognize that the Christian life is one, is one of resting while we work? And would you help us to live with joy in doing both, Father? Would you help us to live with a contagious joy so that when the lost world sees us, when they observe our lives, they'll know that we are indeed people who have rest in Christ, but we're indeed people who take delight in working out of the rest that he gives us. And would your kingdom be advanced in our lives looking this way? It's in the name of your son we pray. Amen.